We had a few solid underdog wins, and we had two different people come from behind and finish their opponents in the third round to save their fight. I think UFC 299 absolutely delivered and was a spectacular card. My name is Angelo. This is We Want Picks. And let's go ahead and recap UFC 299. Before we talk about the fights, let's talk about the bets. I hit every single bet I put on the board. Well, that's not true. One of them was refunded. I had inside the distance, decision, no action on Piotr Jan, which means it went to a decision. I got a refund on that fight. Every other bet I put on the board hit. I put up 83% ROI. I had two different safety parlays that hit last night. If you want to unlock all the bets, the picks, the safety parlays, and more for UFC Vegas 88, it's only freaking $10 a month. For an entire month, that's four events for $10. Just go to wewantpicks.com, click become a member at the top. You can unlock that safety parlay, which is a resounding success. Jacob made money as well. His underdog lock of the week, Pedro Munoz, did lose. But thankfully for him, he has far more than just that one bet. He did make some money, and our DraftKings ownership projections were the best. All in all, a very, very good night for us. Again, if you want to unlock everything that we do for every single fight card, it's only $10 a month. That's $2.50 a week. People got UFC 299 for $2.50, and I gave them stuff like this. It's a no-brainer. WeWantPicks.com. Click Become a Member at the top. UFC 299 opened with a retirement fight. Joanne Wood was going to retire. She said, this is my last fight. I'm out of here, guys. And I picked her to win. I said, just look at who these women have fought. Joanne Wood's the better fighter than Marina Moroz. And sure, Joanne Wood lost nine years ago when they fought the first time, but this isn't nine years ago. Look what happened to their career since then. And then halfway through the first round, I was like, well, I'm stupid. I'm an idiot. I can't pick fights to save my life. What is wrong with me? And then the second round came, and all of a sudden, Joanne Wood's not getting taken down insanely easy. Third round comes, and she is a dog. She was down. She needed to win that third round to win this fight. And frankly, that third round was super close until she dropped Marina Moroz, blasted her, blasted her late in the third round to steal that round and win that fight. That might be the best way to go out, literally. Before this, the best retirement fight I had ever seen was Robbie Lawler. Went out there, fought a young, hungry guy, absolutely knocked him out cold, got the best standing ovation I've ever seen for a retirement fight. So that probably still is the best retirement fight I've ever seen, but Joanne Wood's retirement, like actual fight itself, was great. First round sucked. The next two rounds were wild, back and forth, super tense, and she was able to make it happen. Congratulations to her. Let's hope she stays retired. That's not the first time she retired. So let's hope she stays retired and isn't like, oh, did I just get a performance on the night bonus? Which I don't know if she did. Oh, did I just win? Well, I'm, I'm pretty good. I mean, you know, maybe I got one more left in me. Don't do it. That was, a, what a wild way to go out. Go out that way. Stay retired. I mean, Joanne Wood, we knew she was a dog, and that's what it came down to. She just out-dogged. Her way to a win. I think Asu Almabayev might be the real deal. I picked him to win. He was the third leg of the safety parlay. I figured he would outwork and out wrestle CJ Vergara. I thought he might be able to finish CJ, and there were some moments there where it looked like he could. There were also some moments where he got hit. And as odd as it sounds, I liked that we saw Asu Almabayev get hit because we knew he can come forward. We knew he can spin, and like his striking is wild. Is it good? No. Is it wild? Yes. He'll spin. He'll just bomb. If I mean, the stuff he does is crazy, but his wrestling is spectacular. He's not afraid to get into a slug fight. And he is tough as shit. He ate some very big shots. Didn't quit. Didn't back up. Didn't go down. Just kept coming forward. Kept fighting. CJ Vergara was massive in this fight. He was tremendous. Like, yeah, he missed weight, whatever. But he was huge in this fight. And he would just march forward. He's had such a weird... C.J. Vergara has a very odd striking. He like leans forward and plots. It's an odd striking style. But Asu did a great job. Obviously, he was a tremendous favorite, so I'm not blowing anybody's mind. This isn't a hot take saying that Asu Almabayev is very good. But I am glad this wasn't a two-second takedown submission because we got to see, oh, he can take a shot. Oh, he can go three full rounds with wrestle-heavy game plans. He'll stay in your face. He'll keep spinning. He'll keep doing everything. He's the same guy in the third round as he is in the first round. And I love to see that. Asu is nasty. He does need to clean up his striking because somebody with some power 
can absolutely blast him while he's doing some random spin for zero reason whatsoever. CJ Vergara, I mean, he showed up. He fought his ass off. It is what it is. But he just was not the better fighter. Just wasn't the better fighter. And he lost because of it. But Asu Almabayev might be the real deal. And I'm curious who they give him next. Speaking of real deals, is Robelis de Spain the real deal? His last three fights before the Josh Parisian fight were a total of 19 seconds. 19 seconds in three fights, total cage time. Then he came in here, fought Josh Parisian, and he opened as a massive favorite. He was like minus 500, minus 600. And that tightened all the way down to minus 300 because people, understandably so, were like, well, I don't know how good he is, right? We don't know. We haven't seen him in any trouble. We haven't seen him defend a takedown. We haven't seen him fight anybody with any experience. And yeah, Josh Parisian kind of sucks, but he sucks in the UFC. He's one of the better heavyweights that sucks. And he's durable. Turns out, I mean, turns out, Robellis is the real deal. The real deal. Now, can we definitively say this guy is going to be one of the best heavyweights in the world? He's going to win the battle? I, we can't say that yet. This was another five seconds of fighting. How the hell do we know? What I will say is the power was even more dramatic than I thought it would be. He fell down, right? He threw a kick and fell down. And as he's getting up, he's on like a uh, one leg flop and boom, cracks Josh Parisian with one arm, no hips whatsoever, just arm power, blast Josh Parisian, who's typically pretty durable. And that was the beginning of the end. Robelis de Spain, nasty, powerful striker. I am curious what happens when he starts to feel like a Jolton Almeida. Him versus Jolton Almeida, we'll talk about that guy in a minute. But him versus Jolton Almeida would be a very interesting fight. Because Jolton's wrestling looked great last night. And we don't know if Rombellis can defend a takedown yet. But we do know he can remove your head from your body with relative ease. So for now, we have to assume he's the real deal. But I am very interested in his next fight. He's 35. The UFC doesn't have a ton of time. They don't have three years to slow. They got to build this guy up immediately. Hopefully not as not Shamil style. But they got to build him up immediately and make something happen. And we got Michelle Pajeda at 185 pounds looking spectacular. This was potentially the most one-sided fight I've ever seen. Literally. So there was a finish, which is great. He took him down, no problem. Blasted him in the face, no problem. He literally beat him in every single aspect of MMA. Was the better wrestler, the better grappler, the better striker. And the wild part is, it was at 185 pounds. Michelle Pajeda, famously a 170-pounder, missed weight a couple of times, but still would make it. Fought at 170 for years. He was the bigger fighter. I was very confident in Michelle Pajeda going into this fight. I had a money line bet on him. If you want to see all the bets, just go to the first slide. So I was very confident in him to win, but I was a little bit worried, right? McCall, Olin Jacek is lightning fast. And he was winging punches. And Michelle Pajeda did not care. Just didn't care. Came forward, landed his own insane power. Did whatever he wanted to do. It sucks if people had Michelle Pajeda by knockout. Sucks for those tickets because he won with this submission. It was like a modified rear naked choke and he squeezed the life out of McCall Olin Jacha. I mean, Michelle Pajeda, it's the, his last two fights or his first two fights at 185 pounds and quite literally the best he has ever looked. In those two fights. It's absolutely insane how good Michelle Pajeda looks at 185 pounds. We know he's got cardio. We know the power has carried up to 185 pounds. We know he's got good striking. We know he can rest. I mean, he's got all the tools. And all of a sudden, 85 is very interesting again. Curious if they give him uh, a contender. Set him up for a rematch. Not a rematch. A rematch. Set him up for a fight with Drikas Duplessis. A Sean Strickland style fight. I'm very curious to see what they do next with him. Because at 170 pounds, you, it'd be hard to argue that he deserved a title shot. At 185 pounds, that division's kind of wide open. Two spectacular wins. Get him another two wins, and boom. All of a sudden, we have Michelle Pajeda fighting for a title at 185 pounds. And here's the problem. Here's the problem with a couple of fighters on this card. Striking looks good. Can't defend the takedowns. Felipe Linz won this fight with the takedowns. He chopped down on Kutalaba's legs early. First of all, it's not on. It's like, I forget. They were saying it last night. And, you know, we break down the fights. I watch the tape. I, I hear the names over and over and over. And then I still just default to sounding it out phonetically. ION is like, 
Lynn. It was something weird. Anyway, Felipe Lins chopped down Kutalaba's legs early. Chopped him down early, beat him up. But Kutalaba still had success just moving forward and bombing away. You have to give Kutalaba credit. I mean, he is tough. He's not going to quit on himself. He literally is just bombing away on his feet, trying to find that finish. And Felipe's got a chin. He's a durable guy, but the wrestling was the difference. The fact that he could take down Kutalaba literally whenever he wanted to was the difference in this fight. And Kutalaba only has himself to blame. Listen, your leg got chopped up. Your leg got beat up. That is what it is. Some people are just great at leg kicks. That is what it is. But being taken down anytime you had a little bit of success, that's not acceptable. And I'm not as forgiving as maybe I should be, right? I've been wrestling my whole life, and I just assume that these people who fight for a living, this is their only job. Some of them have multiple jobs, but this is their only job for the most part. You're trying to be the best in the world. You're trying to feed your family. You're trying to build generational wealth. You're trying to build your own business. You're trying to build something with the few years, the very few years you have in front of you in the UFC. And you can't defend takedowns when you need to. And I would understand if Felipe Lins was Bo Nickel or Felipe Lins was a wildly accomplished wrestler, a wildly accomplished Division I All-American. I would understand, like, all right, like, you're training MMA, but, like, this kid's been wrestling since he was five. You're just not going to be the better wrestler. But that's not the case. That's not the case. Felipe Lins is a jiu-jitsu guy that learned some takedowns. He's in shape. He's tough. Can shoot some takedowns. You can't defend those. Then you can't be in the UFC. And, unfortunately, Kutalaba's probably out of the UFC. That was probably it for him. But Felipe Lins looked decent. He didn't look great. He was getting pieced up on the feet, at least with punches. He was successful with the leg kicks. But he had plenty of cardio. The commentators want to talk about, he's slowing down, he's exhausted. It didn't matter, though. He did what he needed to do. He was exhausted, shot these takedowns, and got these takedowns. So Felipe Lins put some life back into his career at 38 years old. We'll see what they do with him. He's not. He's kind of a boring, he's not particularly exciting. This fight was decent, but that was because Kutalaba was just moving forward no matter what. But either way, Felipe Lins, solid win, and Kutalaba's probably gone. Yeah, he had a win in his last fight, but he's got plenty of losses as well. Jacob's underdog lock of the week. Jacob picked Pedro Munoz. And you know what? For the first two and a half, maybe three minutes of the first round, Pedro looked great. He saw every strike coming. He was ducking under those wild... Kyler Phillips was throwing head kicks and Pedro Munoz was literally ducking under and Kyler was just spinning right over the top of his head. Pedro looked very good early. And to disagree with that statement is crazy. But he only looked good early. He then very quickly started looking terrible. He started to look a little older. He started to get gun shy. And that was my biggest issue with the Pedro Munoz fight. I picked Kyler Phillips to win. And I figured it would be Kyler's pressure. I figured it would be Kyler's cardio. And that kind of is what it was. Because while Pedro is very good at moving forward, he was moving forward the whole time. He was backing up Kyler Phillips. But after the first round, after he got tagged a few times, he just did not let his hands go. He was just blindly moving forward. Yes, he was backing Kyler up and he was just plodding forward, but he didn't throw anything. And I don't know if it was because he was worried about what was going to come back his way because Kyler, who also has a very weird striking style, is all of a sudden kick, Superman punch, spinning back kick, head kick. Like just, he's just, he's not throwing in combinations. Kyler threw almost zero combinations at all, but everything he threw was different. All of a sudden, head kick, boom, punch to the body. Like, he was just mixing it up like crazy. And he had cardio. He did slow down, but it didn't matter because Pedro Munoz didn't capitalize on it. Pedro Munoz did not take advantage of Kyler slowing down. Pedro Munoz didn't take advantage of Kyler backing up. He backed him up, did almost nothing with it, and then looked disappointed when he lost. Well, I mean, you had the cage control and did nothing with it. And I think age matters. I mean, we knew age mattered, right? But I think it mattered in this fight. While Pedro early was the better fight, he was the better fighter early. Most of the first round. I think it caught up to him. I think he started to doubt himself. He got hit a few times. I think he's like, shit, this guy is fast. What am I supposed to do here? And Pedro's a little older, not as fast. He got rocked, which you don't typically see that. I don't know what's going to happen with Pedro. They may cut him here. I mean... He had quite a few losses in a row. But Kyler looked good. Kyler looked good. He was able to deal with um, the better technical fighter early. 
He was able to stay busy, didn't deviate from his game plan. His cardio looked better than ever. And yes, he's a former steroid user. I don't think that was a factor here. I already saw people saying that, but I don't think that was a factor here. I think Kyler's just younger and busier. I think that's what this came down to. He was younger, he was busy, and he mixed up his striking really, really well. Gamrot is one of my favorite fighters. I have ridden Gamrot in the safety parlay many times. Many, many, many times. Including last night. He was in the base of the safety parlay and then also in the three-leg safety parlay. And you know what? Early didn't look like he should have been in a safety parlay. Early, I I literally was sitting there watching the fights and like, oh my God, I'm going to lose this safety parlay. This is a big week to lose the freaking safety parlay. We had like 86 people sign up on Saturday alone. All of them showed up, all of them looking for the safety parlay and it's going to lose because Gamrot has no chin whatsoever. None. None. It is crazy. And yes, he recovers well. He gets dropped and then he recovers instantly. We've never seen him like, oh, oh, oh. I don't know what that was an impression of. We've never seen him almost knocked out. We have seen him drop over and over and over. And early when RDA dropped him and defended a few takedowns and had Gamrot backing up looking stupid, it looked bad. It looked bad. All the all the Gamrot is a fraud. That was just the general aura in the room. Gamrot's a fraud. This guy sucks. And then he just stuck with the wrestling, got the takedowns, and won like that. Just nonstop wrestling pressure. And while I love that aspect of his game, I hate how chinny he is. This is a guy that I thought could be top five. This is a guy that I thought could fight for a title and do pretty well. No. No. Uh, Gamrot is not beating anybody with solid takedown defense and power. Nobody. He's just not. Because if RDA at 40, yeah, former champion, very well-rounded, all those things. But if RDA at 40 won the first round, I can't imagine what a 30-year-old would look like who could keep that first-round energy for the next two rounds. Gamrot's not going to be able to ever achieve gold and he called out islam let's find out in the winter who has better wrestling who gives a shit dude islam's gonna hit you hard islam's not gonna let's turn this into a wrestling match islam knocked out volkanovsky islam will stand there and strike and he's not worried about your takedowns and you have to be worried about his power so thank you gamrot for the multiple safety parlay wins but i no longer trust you and unless you're fighting somebody that i'm positive can't defend the takedowns I'm just going to go ahead and watch. I do like Gamrock quite a bit. I just don't know how successful he's going to be with that chin being dropped constantly. Going into this fight, he had eight fights in the UFC. He'd been dropped in four of them. Half of his, 50% of his fights, he gets dropped. Eventually, it's not a... That was an impression of somebody being dropped and then right back up. Eventually, it's not going to be that. Eventually, it's going to be... I mean, that was pretty good. Was Jolton Almeida fraud checked? And this is before you answer, and this is fro checked because listen, okay, there's a typo. We lost an hour of sleep last night. I went to bed at two o'clock in the morning, woke up at five, which is basically four. That is two hours of sleep. And if you're going to get a typo, you're going to get a typo. Let's not make a scene about it. You know what this is supposed to say. It's supposed to say fraud check. Was Jolton Almeida fraud checked? And fraud check is a fun word that the kids use to say this guy sucked and he just ran into somebody that showed us he sucked. I don't think so. I do not think Jolton Almeida was fraud checked because he dominated that first round. Dominated it. Absolutely. He did in that first round exactly what I thought he would do for the whole fight. I thought Jolton Almeida would win the fight. He took down Curtis Blades whenever he wanted to. He suplexed Curtis Blades. Suplexed him. Picked him up clean, slammed them to the ground. Jolton Almeida is the real deal. The problem is it's only wrestling. Striking not very good. And this position was bizarre. So if you didn't watch the fight in the first round, Jolton Almeida dominated Curtis Blades. Wasn't even close. Dom, d- d- whooped his ass. Jolton Almeida, here's some perspective. For those people who pay dra- play DraftKings Fantasy, Jolton Almeida was stopped in the second round. He had 55 points in DraftKings. He scored 55 DraftKings fantasy points in a round. That's crazy. 
Anyway, first round, ragdolled Curtis Blades. Just ragdolled him. Took him down whenever he wanted to. Was on top. Tons of control. Had him in rear naked chokes. Curtis Blades stood up. Jolton picked him up. Slammed him down. Just dominated. Dominated Curtis Blades. The whole time. And then in the second round, shoots a single. And is just camping out. Just, just camping out in that leg. And Curtis Blades just hammer fist and elbowed the side of his head until he was unconscious. And I don't know what that was. I don't know. I think Jolton froze up maybe. Like, I don't know why Jolton didn't move. He got to the leg and then just stayed there. And that's what allowed Curtis to just blast the side of his head until he was out. So, two things. One, good on Curtis Blades for not giving up on himself. I mean, he got ragdolled. And that can't be good for your confidence in the middle of a fist fight, getting tossed around like you're supposed to be the better wrestler and you were getting dominated in the wrestling. But he didn't quit on himself. He had his opening, threw all his punches, made it happen. So that's the Curtis Blades side. The Jolton Almeida side, I don't know what happened. I don't. He wasn't tired, so that wasn't it. I don't know why he froze up. He literally froze, just stopped moving and ate like 16. Casey in the media room was counting. One, two, three, like I think it was 16 unanswered strikes to the side of the head before he covered up and went limp. So I personally do not think that was a fraud check. I think we already knew Jolton Almeida was a savage grappling beast, and he proved that point. He beat who people will say is the best wrestler in the division. He beat him at his best thing, wrestling. We still don't know if Jolton can strike because he doesn't strike. So we still don't know. What's it going to look like if he's standing? We don't know. We do know that if he hangs out on a leg and eats 16 shots to the side of the head from a giant, he's going to lose. That's what we know. So I do not think Jolton Almeida was fraud checked. I do think he's still going to have a lot of success in this division. It's kind of a sloppy division, a very sloppy division. I, he would beat Rosenstruck just with that wrestling. He could potentially beat Robellas just with that wrestling. We don't know. That's a wild statement to make. But point being, Jolton is not fraud checked, and I don't think he's done. I think he's got a lot of wins, a lot of success that he could still have in this division. Pay-per-view opener. We had another fight where wrestling changed the whole thing. Song Yudong looked spectacular early. In that first round, he looked phenomenal. Couple of takeaways. Very clear he had more power. Very, very clear that Song Yudong was the more powerful striker. Takeaway number two. His takedown fakes were unbelievable. He would just lower his level, tap Piotr Jan's knee, and Piotr Jan full sprawled shot his ass back, threw his hips to the ground, full sprawled, and Yudong never even took a shot. She's like, uh, uh, made you flinch. And he looked great. That first round, it was like, oh my God, Song Yudong is going to be a future champion. And then he started to fade a little bit, and Pyotr Jan started to make the reads. I think this was a reminder from Pyotr, hey guys, I'm one of the best in the world. I'm a slow starter, which he is. I'm a slow starter, but I am still one of the best in the world. Once he started to make the reads, he had some success striking. And then he had some success wrestling. The wrestling is ultimately what won Pyotr Jan this fight because Song Yudong won that first round very clearly. Won most of the second round with forward pressure, great, great combinations, and big power. Won most of the second round. And then Piotr started to land a little more, and then he snuck in a few takedowns. Right at the end of the round, one minute left, boom, takedown. Damn it. That won on the round. Third round, similar story. So Piotr Jan genuinely won this fight. He deserved to win this fight. He's earned himself a close decision win as well, based off all the close decision losses he got. So Piotr Jan, I don't think we learned anything new from him. We knew he was a dog. We knew he was a very good striker. We knew he could wrestle. I don't think we learned anything new. I think we did learn some things about Song Yudong. On the good, if this is a Venn diagram, you know what a Venn diagram is? The two circles. You have the left, the right, and then the middle where it's overlapping. If we're looking at the good, the good side of the Venn diagram, Song Yudong has incredible forward pressure, incredible combinations. He's an absolute giant in this weight class, has good power, has improved wrestling. That's on the good side. The bad side is offensive wrestling is improved. Defensive wrestling still needs some work. And a lot of it is because Purion had very well-timed takedowns. Like, just combo, boom, shot a double out of nowhere. Very well-timed takedowns. But Song's got to scramble. Song's got to work through those. That's the only way that Song's going to be able to have success and be a top five guy at this weight class 
is if he works on the wrestling. Because if you cannot take Song Yudong down, he will outstrike you. He will beat you. He looked very good last night, but it just wasn't enough. But he's early 20s. This dude is super young, and there's a lot left in his career. Jack Della Maddalena with a wild third round comeback. A wild third round comeback. If we're going to do that Venn diagram again, good news is Jack does not quit on himself. Jack is very clearly a phenomenal striker, and he carries power late. Bad news is still gets taken down. Still makes some pretty poor decisions on the ground as well. I, last night, they said he's a brown belt. He didn't look like a brown belt. Because, yes, he didn't get submitted on the ground, but he gave up some bad positions. He worked his way out of them, but he ended up in some bad positions, like often. He definitely needs to work on his wrestling. He beat Gilbert Burns, which on paper is a massive accomplishment, and Gilbert was winning that fight early with the wrestling, but Gilbert's a 155-pounder that's blown up. His takedowns are not that good, and he did eat some shots. So, yes... Good win. We were all very confident in Jack Della to win, Jacob, myself. We got a lot of hate. Gilbert Burns seemed to be the consensus underdog of the week. And for two rounds, he looked like he should have been the consensus underdog of the week. But then Jack kept his power, was always landing the better shots. He was landing the better shots the entire fight. Every minute of that fight, he was landing the better shots. And then every now and then, Gilbert Burns would just bomb something huge. It would connect. Jack didn't care, and he would continue to move. But Gilbert's wrestling looked better. You can tell that was his game plan. I got to go all in on the wrestling here. And Jack defended one or two takedowns, but he needs better takedown defense. I hope his takeaway in this win was, thank God. Thank God I was able to get, oh my God. I need to work on my wrestling. Like hopefully it's that. Hopefully it's not like, of course I was going to win. I've got such incredible power. I'm such a good striker. Of course I was going to win. I hope he looks at it objectively and is like, I need to work on my wrestling. Because Basil Hafez tossed him around. Gilbert Burns had plenty of takedowns. And eventually, you're going to run into somebody that will take you down and hang in the striking. Right now, he's probably one of the best strikers in the division. Is he the best? I don't know. One of the best? Yes. He's absolutely one of the best strikers in the division. We'll talk about MVP in a minute. That would be a very interesting fight. A very interesting fight. But the comeback was great. I had a money line bet on him. So I'm very glad he won this fight and won by finish. Very glad. Very thankful. But Jack Dell's got to work on the wrestling. Has to. If a blown up 155 pounder is basically taking down whenever he wants to, that's a problem. And it'll be a bigger problem as he works up the ranks. Jack Dell Madalena, 7-0 in the UFC. Striking was always great. Looked great last night. Got to work on the wrestling. These are those scorecards. Just a reminder, he was losing this fight. If he didn't finish Gilbert Burns in the third round, he lost this fight. And I agree with these scorecards. I agree that he lost the first two rounds. I, Sal D'Amato's wrong. Sal D'Amato's wrong. I don't think Jack Della Maddalena won that first round. I think Gilbert Burns won the first and the second round. Just with takedowns, control, winning scrambles, was holding Jack when he got the takedowns. Jack, very good striker, but... Can't defend the takedowns, can't be top five. And here's Michael Venom Page. This guy is fast as hell. It is crazy. This is another fight I picked him to win. I bet on him at even money. I would have gotten better odds if I waited. And I knew who Michael Venom Page was from Bellator. But I also was a little nervous coming into this fight for two reasons. One, Venom fought Baton, you know, like nobody. Nobody. Like his, you go through his record, it's a bunch of nobodies. And two, I knew Kevin Holland was insanely tough. And we saw that toughness here. But Venom Page's ability to cover ground is wild. It is wild. That dude will cover six, seven feet of ground and blast you right in the face. This is one of many spinning back elbows. One of his spinning back elbows, he set up by faking a leg kick from his left leg. And then all of a sudden, he comes in and you get elbowed in the face with a spinning back elbow from his right arm. It's insane what this guy can do. His takedown defense looked good as well. And Kevin Holland has some of the worst takedowns you'll ever see. So I guess maybe I shouldn't have said his takedown defense looked good as well. But the only time he was actually taken down, he did it to himself. And that is hard to watch sometimes because Venom Page will come in like a car crash 
And he'll fall down. He will literally fall down because he comes in so aggressively, so fast, and so awkwardly. He'll cross his legs. He will fall down. It's crazy he doesn't get knocked out constantly because he just come. His hands are at his knees. He comes in ready to be cracked, but he's so fast. And the elbow example, he's so fast. You think you're getting kicked and you get elbow. Like what this guy can do is amazing. Problem is. He's 36 years old, 36. So this is another similar situation to Robellis where the UFC needs to turn this guy into a superstar and they don't have a ton of time. This was a great matchup. This was a great matchup for him. He was able to showcase his striking, defend a couple of takedowns. He was on the ground and it's funny. I think it's just his facial expression, but when he was on the ground after he made a mistake, and Kevin Holland basically had his neck in a rear naked choke, and then he turns, he's on his back, his face like... I think it's just his face, because he clearly wasn't panicked. He worked his way through, got back to his feet, dominated this fight. But he looked panicked. He was like, oh my God. But Michael Venom Page is very, very exciting, and I hope... What I hope the UFC does with him is... I hope they just say, we're not going to try to make him a champion. He's too old. We're not going to try to make him a champion. What we are going to do, though, is give him some really fun fights. Let's just make him a ton of fun. Turn him in the cowboy, right? Just exciting, fun fights. Let him fight Jack Della Maddalena. That'll be a fun fight. Let him fight 170 pounders who aren't going to try to take him down constantly. I would love to watch that. Michael Venom Page, very, very exciting guy to watch, and I'm going to continue to watch him for the next couple of years. This is Dustin Poirier versus Benoit Saint-Denis. Let me just show you what we got here. This was immediately after his corner said, stop going for guillotines. Okay, and that's him going for a guillotine. Dustin Poirier got his ass kicked in that first round. Got smacked around, got touched up, taken down at will, bullied, beaten up, kept jumping guillotine for some stupid reason. And I know he's got a great guillotine. I know he's got a great guillotine. He almost submitted Khabib with that guillotine. Here it is again. Dustin, stop jumping guillotine. Immediately jumps guillotine. Immediately. It's crazy. It's crazy. He ended up winning this fight off of guts alone. And Dustin Poirier was always the better fighter going into this matchup. Always. I don't think anybody thought that Benoit was the better fighter. I think people, myself included, were like, Dustin's chin is gone. Benoit comes in here at 1,000 miles an hour and is probably going to ragdoll him and maybe finish him. And the first round, that's what we had, a ragdolling. Benoit came in. There was some back and forth. But Benoit came in, started ragdolling. Dustin's jumping guillotine, doing whatever he can to try to survive. And he did survive. And before you look at the time and see when St. Denis was finished and you say, oh, he got tired. He did not get tired. He did not blow his load. He did not get tired. Dustin landed a perfectly clean shot. He put his lights out and it had nothing to do with exhaustion and everything to do with just solid technique. Dustin always had that dog in him. He was able to use that dog to survive and then just blast when Benoit came in a little sloppy in the second round. What is wild we had the over one and a half. Jacob and I both had the over one and a half in this round, in this fight. And we had it parlayed. And my parlay came down to this fight going over one and a half rounds, which means it has to get past the two minute and 30 second mark of the second round. And at two minutes and 30 seconds, Benoit saint Denis was blasted and dropped out cold. And thank God it took that referee two full seconds to get to him to stop the fight. Because if it didn't, we would have lost that. I mean, that was the tightest one and a half round line I've ever seen in my life. There was a fight three years ago where they called the fight exactly at the two minute and 30 second mark. Exactly at that. So the over didn't hit, the under didn't hit. Most books were funded that. But this is the closest I could ever remember outside of the one that literally hit. I mean, we were sweating it. Overall, Dustin is Dustin. He's a dog. He's got good technique. He weathered a storm. Dustin is the only vet that won here. Dustin did what everybody thought Gilbert Burns was going to do. Survive and get it done. So Dustin's an absolute dog. We knew he was a dog. I didn't think he'd be able to... I thought Benoit's relentless pressure would be the issue. And it was an issue for a while until he landed clean. Benoit can't help being knocked out cold. That's not... He doesn't control his chin. It'll be interesting to see what happens next. Because he's not a clean striker. Benoit's not the more technical guy in almost any fight. But he is tough. He's got power. He's got wrestling. Good pressure. 
He's basically the Dreykus Duplessis of this division. Comes in crazy and can beat people off pressure. So Dustin reminded people he's got the dog in him. He's still a top lightweight in the world. And this was a tough fight to take because, as he said in his post-fight interview, Benoit saint is not famous. I fought this guy. He's not famous. I didn't get anything out of this other than I still want to fight some of the best guys in the division. So congratulations to Dustin. I was very, very happy. The only bet I had was over one and a half. So I was very happy that I got that bet and we got to see Dustin win. How do you not like Dustin? Everybody loves Dustin. Here we go. Don't pull guillotine. And he pulled guillotine. What a joke. And let's talk about the main event. Chito Vera has the chin of all chins. That sound, the knee that blasted him in the chin sounded like when they clap the, if you don't hear it, but the 10 seconds before every round end, they go, kunk, kunk, kunk. they clap like two wooden things and it makes a clap noise. Let everybody know there's 10 seconds left. Ref, get ready. Fighters, 10 seconds left. That's what it sounded like. This knee hit Cheeto so hard. All you heard was, kunk, kunk, kunk. I don't know what the hell that sound was. Just imagine a very loud crack sound. That's what it said. Like, Cheeto's got to have something broken in his face. Got to. The, the knee to the chin. He ate a right. Like, this dude has to have broken stuff. It is crazy what his chin is. And if you could take Cheeto's chin and give him aggression, he could have won this fight. Problem is, he moves forward, takes his beating, but doesn't throw anything in return. Throws nothing. I don't understand the gun shy. If you have that chin, you know. He knows. I'm not going to get knocked out. No shot. He knows. So why are you not just moving forward and throwing as much as possible? You know you don't have to worry about what comes back your way. Why are you not just throwing as much as possible? So a little frustrating. And Cheeto's always been that guy. Always. He's never been the high-volume forward pressure guy. He's always been that guy. But it is frustrating. This is the biggest fight of your career. Try. Just try. And it didn't look like he was trying. And I know that's his fighting style but it did not look like he was trying. Sean O'Malley, on the other hand, was more aggressive than we've seen him before. His striking was pinpoint accurate. Footwork was great. He did get blasted a few times and dealt with it well, didn't get frustrated. Landed this knee and Cheeto was still standing there and that could break some people mentally. Like, how is this guy still in front of me? Sean O'Malley looked great. I think he gets smoked by Marab and I think he knows it too, which is why he said, I want Ilya Taporia. No, okay. First of all, no, you don't. Ilya will beat you too. I think, and, and people are going to hate this, I think this was one of like very few winnable fights in the top five of 35 or 45 for Sean O'Malley. Because forward pressure wrestling is going to have an issue. Marab is going to beat him, no problem. No problem. No problem. But he did look great. He is making the adjustments. The striking is phenomenal. Strike for strike, he's a better striker than pretty much 90% of these people. But once you start working in some grappling, he can keep his hands low. He's too busy trying to be wildly accurate. That There's a lot going on. But Sean O'Malley looked spectacular last night. Incredible win. Great for him to get that back. He can now basically say he's undefeated, even though he technically isn't. And Cheeto Vera, th this chin's not going to last much longer. I don't know who he's going to fight next and all that, but... You can't absorb this punishment for the entirety of your career. It will not be long before he finally gets his lights put out. But overall, spectacular pay-per-view. And I'm very happy that I was able to watch that and have all that success betting. If you guys want to unlock all the picks, the bets, the round line leans, and more, just go to wewantpicks.com, click become a member at the top. Here's a look at that safety parlay. I'm very proud of my safety parlay. I put up a parlay, one or more, for every single event every single week. It hits at over 71% event accuracy. The lifetime return on investment is almost 30%. I have hit 11 of the last 13 parlays I put on the board, and it's only $10 a month. The parlay is not $10 a month. Every single thing we do is $10 a month, including the tools that we'll give you. The line movement tracker is one of those tools. The detailed data metrics and analytics is one of those tools. The DraftKings ownership projection is one of those tools. We had the best ownership projection in the game last night. 3.61% margin. And if you work your way across, not a single other company had a three in there. 4.26 was the closest. And if you're building a DraftKings lineup, you know how much that matters. And that will be preloaded into the optimizer. All of this and so much more, we want picks.com. Click become a member at the top. It's only $10 a month. $10 for an entire month. That's $2.50 an event. Guys, thanks so much for the watch. Become a premium member. We appreciate all the support.